One of the sad realities of our world is that not everyone has parents who make them feel loved and appreciated. Sometimes they think they're doing what's best for us when, in reality, they're pushing us away. That's how Jennifer Pan felt about her parents, who worked her to exhaustion, trying to build her future when, in reality, she just wanted to be free. How did she find a way out? By having her parents murdered. Jennifer Pan is a well-known name in Markham, Ontario, as her crimes horrified and intrigued the community she grew up in and Ontario as a whole. It wasn't just the brutality of her crimes that captivated the nation, but how her own lies resulted in her downfall. Jennifer Pan was born on June 17, 1986 to her parents Han Pan and Bik Ha Pan. Both were refugees that came to Canada from Vietnam. They met and married in Toronto before moving to Scarborough, and starting a family. Jennifer's younger brother Felix was born three years after her and they moved a couple of different places as their parents tried to find their place in the world. Han and Bic were very ambitious and determined to make a life for their family in Canada. By 2004, they'd managed to save enough money to buy a beautiful home in Markham and two luxurious cars. Now that they were able to live comfortably, they focused on making sure their kids were following in their footsteps and developing a good work ethic. From a young age, Jennifer was an extremely talented figure skater. She trained pretty much every day, as well as going to school and piano lessons. She aspired to compete as a figure skater in the Olympic Games, but that dream was cut short by a horrible knee injury. She was told she would never compete again. With her figure skating career over, Jennifer's parents focused on making sure she did well enough in school that she'd get into a good college and get a respectable job. This wasn't as simple as it sounded. Jennifer had been allowed to get away with her C grades to focus on skating, but now her parents expected straight A's. According to testimonies from Jennifer's friends, Han was much stricter than his wife, who was more of an unwilling accomplice when it came to disciplining their kids. Jennifer wasn't allowed to date or go to school dances out of paranoia that it would distract her from her studies. Although Jennifer got high grades in her music class, she averaged around a 70% in the rest of her subjects. The real start of her downfall came when she failed calculus in her senior year, which resulted in Ryerson University revoking its offer of early admission to Jennifer. So what did she do? Instead of admitting the truth to her parents, she did what she'd done a hundred times before. She lied. Throughout her education, Jennifer had faked good grades and report cards to keep her parents off her back. This time, she took it a step further by faking a high school diploma. That's right, she hadn't been able to graduate because of her failed class. When her parents bought the Lie, she took it a step further. She faked an admissions letter to Ryerson and then started leading a secret life. During the day, she said she was going out to classes, but in reality, she was sitting in coffee shops, working as a piano tutor or a waitress at a restaurant. To keep up the story, she bought secondhand textbooks and watched videos to use as notes from her fake classes. She faked yet another offer to study pharmacology at the University of Toronto, and during this time, asked her parents if she could live closer to campus with a friend during the week. She was actually living with her secret boyfriend of eight years, Daniel Wong, a known street dealer. The lies didn't stop with her parents. She even fabricated parts of her life to her friends to make things seem crazier than they were. One time she told a friend that her dad was having her followed by a private investigator to keep tabs on her. It became so much and so complicated that Jennifer had to develop a strategy to cope with the sheer amount of lies she was telling. I tried looking at myself in the third person and I didn't like who I saw, but rationalizations in my head said I had to keep going. Other Otherwise, I would lose everything that ever meant anything to me. Eventually, her lies caught up with her. Jennifer told her parents that she was volunteering at a lab in a children's hospital as a part of her pharmacology degree, but this was where her story had started to unravel and her parents grew suspicious. They thought it was weird that Jennifer didn't have a hospital uniform or even an ID badge. They only had her word as confirmation that she was working. One day, they followed Jennifer on her supposed way to work and discovered the truth. Han was so angry with his daughter that he wanted to throw her out of the house and disown her. But Beach persuaded him to let Jennifer stay. Now in her early 20s, Jennifer had no qualifications or career prospects, so her parents did the only thing they could, try to fix the situation. Jennifer was made to go back to high school to retake calculus and get her diploma, but their anger and disappointment were still obvious. They took away Jennifer's phone, laptop, and forbade her from seeing Daniel anymore. 
even though they did continue to speak in secret. But Daniel was getting tired of constantly trying to maintain this relationship for years. At this point, Jennifer was basically under house arrest, and with how mad her dad was with her, who knew when she'd be allowed to have any freedom again? Plus, to Jennifer's horror, he'd met someone else. So he decided to break things off with Jennifer and pursue this new relationship, one that he thought actually had a future. Still madly in love with Daniel, Jennifer didn't take the breakup well and started working on a plan to get him back. She created an elaborate story that would make him question just how much he really liked his new girlfriend. She told Daniel that his new girlfriend had sent a warning to stay away, and it came in the form of five men and a threat to her life. Jennifer told Daniel that they broke into her house pretending to be policemen, then violated her in the hallway of her home. A few days later, a bullet had been sent to her in an envelope. Of course, none of this was true, but her manipulation tactics seemed to work because she and Daniel were back in regular contact. Although, Jennifer's love for him might not have been her only motivation. In messages that would later be exposed by the police, Jennifer and Daniel had actually been formulating a plan to get Jennifer's parents out of their lives for good. Jennifer had reconnected with an old friend from school, Andrew Montmere, who was able to put her in touch with a man who would get rid of her parents for a fee. That man was Ricardo Duncan. He and Jennifer hatched a plan that he would kill Han in the parking lot of his job. At this time, it seemed he was the only target of Jennifer's hatred, not her mom. She paid Ricardo $1,500, and they arranged to confirm the details over a phone call at a later date. That never happened. Ricardo completely ghosted Jennifer. No details were ever finalized, and he never pulled off the hit. However, she was now certain that this was something she wanted, so she and Daniel tried again. He put her in touch with a man known as Homeboy, his actual name being Lenford Crawford. He claimed to be an experienced hitman and usually charged $20,000 for his services. However, since Jennifer was a friend of Daniel's, he offered her a very generous 50% discount. She told Lenford that she'd pay him once she got her share of the inheritance following the death of her parents, which was estimated to be $500,000. After some small setbacks, they managed to set a date. November 8th, 2010. That evening, Felix was spending a late night on his college campus. Jennifer was watching TV in her room, Han was reading a newspaper, and Bic was at a line dancing class. Han went to bed at 8.30 p.m., and Bic arrived home an hour later, staying downstairs for a while to watch TV. Jennifer came downstairs and subtly unlocked the front door before saying goodnight to her mom for the last time and heading back to her room. The hit started just after 10 p.m., when Lenford and his accomplices, Eric Carty and David Mivelygam barged into the home. One man tied up Bic while the other two went upstairs in search of Han and Jennifer. Han was woken up to a gun in his face before he was dragged downstairs and tied up next to his wife. Jennifer willingly let the third man tie her arms behind her back, meanwhile guiding him to a few thousand dollars in cash hidden in her bedroom and her mom's nightstand. Vic begged the intruders not to hurt her daughter. She and Han had their heads covered with blankets. Then the assailants started firing. Han was hit in his shoulder and face, while Bic was hit three times in the head killing her instantly. Jennifer was taken upstairs and tied to the stair railing, where she waited for the men to leave before calling the police. I'm broken and I heard shots like pop. I don't know what's happening. I'm tied upstairs. I'm okay. My dad just went outside screaming. Amazingly, Han survived the ordeal. He ran out of his house yelling for help and got the attention of a neighbor. He was taken to the hospital and Jennifer was taken to the police station to give a statement. From the get-go, the investigators knew something was off. They couldn't figure out why Jennifer had survived and how she was able to call the police with her hands tied. So now, how can you get to the phone? And how do you make the phone call? Further analysis of Jennifer's phone records were damning. Although Daniel had given her a second phone to communicate with Homeboy, she'd still discuss the murders with Daniel on her personal cell phone. When Jennifer realized the police were catching on, she claimed that she hired the men to take her own life, but there'd been some kind of mix-up that resulted in her parents' deaths. They didn't believe a word of it. The extensive digital evidence helped the police arrest Jennifer and the four men who helped her kill her parents. They all pleaded not guilty, and the trial, predicted to last for six months, 
months went on for nearly a year. Han and Felix both testified against Jennifer, deconstructing her years of lies and deception. All five assailants were found guilty. Jennifer, Daniel, Lenford, and David were sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. Eric Carty's trial was delayed until 2015 when his lawyer fell ill. Eventually, he pled guilty to his crimes and received a sentence of 18 years behind bars with the possibility of parole after nine. This was due to his guilty plea and his lesser involvement in the crime. Big Ka Pan was laid to rest on November 19th, 2010, three days before her daughter was arrested for arranging her death. Sadly, due to his injuries, Han was unable to go to his wife's funeral, but continues to remember her and celebrate her life with Felix. Neither of them is in contact with Jennifer. That brings us to the end of today's video. What did you think of this case? Do you think Jennifer will ever be allowed out into the real world again? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below.